group theory in modular arithmetic. In the previous video, we covered group theory. So if you haven't seen that video, I encourage you to watch that. And also this video is the fourth part of a series. So I also recommend that you go and watch those videos before this one, because they are prerequisites to watching this. So as a recap from before, a group is a set with a binary operator that satisfies closure. There exists an identity element. Every element has an inverse and the operation is associative. And we remembered that with the acronym Cyphrin is incredibly awesome. We considered all of these properties with the infinite set of integers, but what about for a finite set? What about when we are considering a set of integers modulo some other integer? Now I'm going to use a little symbol throughout this lesson. So let's just quickly define it. So we can say that the set of integers can be denoted with this big fancy capital Z. And then we can say that this set of integers is modulo n by using a subscript n. If the modulus is prime, then we can denote it with Z subscript P for prime. When we are trying to find out whether a set with a binary operator is a group in modular arithmetic, things work a little bit differently, particularly when considering the inverse. So we are going to be covering inverses in modular arithmetic, a binary operator with the set of integers modulo sum n. Remember that for any element a in the set, the inverse is such that when it is operated on with the inverse, which we're going to denote with b, sometimes we denote it with a subscript inv, but like they're kind of the same thing. This is going to be the same as b operated on with a, and this will yield the identity element. So this is the definition of an inverse. Let's first find the additive inverse. So I am going to use blue to talk about the additive inverse. To find the additive inverse of A for the finite set of integers, which we're going to denote with the big Z, modulo N, we need to find an element A inv such that A plus a inv is congruent to, which is kind of the same as equals in modular arithmetic. If you don't know what congruence means, I recommend you go back and watch the modular arithmetic video because I'm going to assume you know what congruence is. The identity element, which with the addition operator is zero. If you don't know why it's zero, then go back and watch the group theory video, mod n. So this is the relation that we are trying to find. We need to find a inv such that this is true and I'm going to be labeling my equations. So this is equation one. So let's rearrange that equation. So we're going to rearrange equation one for a inv. So we can say that a inv is congruent to minus a mod n, and then we'll call this equation two. Now, step two, we need to make sure a inv lies in the range zero to n minus one. Why? because we need to make sure that a inv is in the set. So aka a inv is in the set. If we know that a is in the set, minus a is not in the set. So in order to make sure that that is true, we can add a inv is congruent to minus a mod n. And due to the way that congruence works, we can actually add n to make it wrap around and find the element which is actually in the set. So minus a plus n, because this is still congruent, mod n. So therefore we can say that a inv is congruent to n minus a mod n. And I'm going to call this equation three, because this is how we find additive inverse of an element a. So let's use an example. Let's find the additive inverse of three mod seven. Step one, we can say that the inverse of three, so we've got a equals to three, Therefore, a inv must be congruent to minus three mod n. Now we need to make sure that this wraps around. So this is also congruent to minus three plus seven mod seven. And actually we could substitute the seven in there as well. And this is congruent to, let's just simplify this. Seven minus three is four, Mr. Bracket here, mod seven. So we have found that the inverse of three mod seven is four mod seven. And that is it. So we can write a general rule 
for any A in the set, which we denote with this E-like symbol, for any A in the set of integers, which we denote with this massive capital Z, modulo N, the additive inverse is found with the equation number three. So we can write this out again. A in is equal to N minus A mod N. And this is true as long as A is not equal to zero. If A is equal to zero, remember if we go back to our initial equation, if A is zero, zero plus our inverse must be equal to zero. Therefore, A in also must be equal to zero. So if A is equal to zero, then A inv must also be, I missed a congruent sign there, must also be congruent to zero, is our golden equation for finding the additive inverse. And what do we label that? Equation number three. Let's move on to multiplicative inverse, and I'm going to use red in modular arithmetic. So let's go back to our initial definition. So we need to find for any element A, when operated on with its inverse, here I'm using the dot to mean multiplication. In the previous video, we used the dot operator, the central dot, to mean any arbitrary operator. The reason I am now using it for multiplication is not to trip you up. It's just because in literature, you will often see the dot operator to mean multiplication rather than any arbitrary binary operator. So I want you to get used to using this notation in different contexts. Based on the fact that we are looking at multiplication, Clearly, we are talking about the multiplication operator. Do not be confused if the same symbols are used in different contexts. Just look at the surrounding context to work out what this operator is supposed to mean. So A multiplied by A inv must be congruent to the identity element, which in multiplication is 1 mod n. With multiplicative inverse, we actually need n to be prime. So I'm going to denote this with P just to make sure that we don't get confused. And I'm going to label this equation equation four. And I will explain now why P needs to be prime. And that is because we need to learn Fermat's little theorem. Fermat's little theorem says that if N or in our case P is prime, so the number with which we are doing the modulus and A is an integer not divisible by P, aka A is not equal to zero mod P, because of course, if it's divisible by P, there's no remainder, therefore it's equal to zero mod P. And the reason that it can't be equal to zero is due to equation one, anything times by zero has to be equal to zero. Therefore, as zero does not have an inverse, then the following relation must hold. A to the power of P minus one is congruent to one mod P. I'm going to label this equation five, and this is Fermat's little theorem. We are not going to derive that. We are just going to accept that this is true, and we are going to use this to find the multiplicative inverse. So if we look at equations five and equations four, the right-hand side of the equations are equal, and we want to find A inverse. Now, equation four divided by A is equal to A inverse. So we can therefore say that A inv is congruent to one divided by A, which is the same as times by A to the power of minus one mod P. Now, if we compare this equation, which we'll call equation six, compare six and five, we can see that six, the right-hand side of six is the same as the right-hand side of five times by A to the minus one. So to make the right-hand sides of five and six equal, we need to do five times by a to the minus one so that we can find a inverse. So a to the p to the minus one times by a to the minus one, because we need to times both the right-hand side and the left-hand side of five by a to the minus one is congruent to one times a to the minus one mod p. So we can see that this is in fact a inverse looking at equation six. So therefore we can say A inverse is congruent to, and if we compare this side with this side and collect like terms, A P to the minus two mod P. And therefore we have a definition for how to find the multiplicative inverse as long as A is not equal to zero and P is prime. Now you'll also see that this is true because of course this is A inverse because A to the minus one 
is equal to 1 over a, which is the multiplicative inverse when we are looking at regular integers. Therefore, a multiplicative inverse must exist for an integer a modulo a prime p as long as a is not divisible by p, aka it's not equal to zero since zero does not have an inverse. Fermat's little theorem is therefore important and mentioned periodically throughout the rest of this series and it explains why in ZK and cryptography we choose the set of integers to not include zero to make sure that the set is a group and that p must also be prime. It's one of the reasons p must be prime. So it's crucial to understanding this. And this set of integers, capital Z, is often denoted subscript p to mean that the modulus is prime and this star means that we are looking at the multiplicative group, therefore the elements cannot be zero. So this group consists of all non-zero elements modulo p forming a multiplicative group where every element has an inverse. Let's go through an example of finding the multiplicative inverse because it's a little bit confusing. Let's take the set of integers in the multiplicative group, so not including zero, modulo 7 and we're going to take the element a equals to 3. If we use this relation the inverse of 3 a inv must be congruent to a to the p minus 2 mod p. Let's substitute in our values so 3 to the power of p which is 7 minus 2 mod 7. Let's do this calculation 3 to the power of 5 mod 7 3 to the power of 5 is 243 mod 7. Let's see how many times 7 goes into 243 in whole numbers. So we can do 243, I'm going to do it over here, divided by 7 is equal to 34.7 blah blah blah. So our whole number is 34, it goes in 34 times. So we can do 34 times 7. So 34 times 7 is 238 and then the difference between these two so 243 minus 238 is equal to 5 which is our remainder so a inv is congruent to 5 mod 7 and that is our inverse element and let's double check that so we know that a times by a inv must be congruent to 1 mod p let's substitute in our numbers so 3 times 5, which is equal to 15, which in modular arithmetic is congruent to 1 mod 7. Since 15 divided by 7 is equal to 14 remainder 1. I don't know if you remember, but back in our modular arithmetic video, we said that we could construct a division-like operator. We now have the tools to construct this operator. So our division-like operator. And the way we can do that is using our, our multiplicative inverse. And we can actually say that this division-like operator is more like inverse multiplication. If we're doing division, we say that a divided by b equals to c. This is the same as saying a times b to the minus one equals c. We know this is the inverse of b. Therefore, if we're doing division in modular arithmetic, we can convert a divided by b to a times b inv mod p. Let's use an example. Let's take p equals to 7, a equals to 5, b equals to 3, since we've already found the multiplicative inverse of 3. So let's substitute this into our equation here. 5 times the inverse of 3, which before we said the inverse of 3 was 5 mod 7. 5 times 5 is 25 mod 7. 25 divided by 7 equals to 3 with 4 remainder. Therefore, we can say that 5 divided by 3 mod 7 is congruent to 4 mod 7. So we have learnt a lot. Initially, we did a recap of what a group is. We defined this mathematical symbol for stating the integers modulo some prime number or some number n. We then went through how to find the additive inverse and we came up with this general rule, equation three, the additive inverse a inv is congruent to n minus a mod n. We then used Fermat's little theorem, equation five, to derive a multiplicative inverse a inv 
is congruent to a to the power of p minus 2 mod p, equation 7. We then went through an example of finding a multiplicative inverse because it was a little bit confusing. We then defined a division-like operator using the multiplicative inverse and did an example of that. So that has been a lot of information. I recommend you go and digest this yourself. I have left some resources in the description below this video if you would like to do some more reading. I hope that made sense. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment box below and I will see you very soon to go through abelian groups, rings and fields. So get excited for that. And leave me a cheeky little comment, like and subscribe if you would like to see more videos.